people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Economic indicators, military might or diplomacy could be the parameters used to determine the rank and reputation of a country. But above all, it is the country's people, residents or non-residents and their actions and accomplishments which build and strengthen the legacy of a country. In the case of India, non-resident Indians or NRIs have created an identity of India, one which is valued and held in high regard. Indeed, NRIs are one of the strongest assets of India. Let's take a closer look at how non-resident Indians have further oiled the wheels of the rapidly moving Indian juggernaut. Nearly a decade ago, the former U.S. President Barack Obama advised his countrymen and policymakers to strengthen their education system. He believed that Indians, among a few other nationalities, would out-educate and out-compete Americans for jobs. In 2018, a report by the Seattle Times, a U.S. daily, confirmed Mr. Obama's concerns. According to the publication, 40% of the foreign-born tech workforce in the city, which is home to Microsoft, Amazon, and Boeing, was of Indian origin. This trend is not unique to Seattle, and Seattle is a microcosm of U.S. industrial trends. Indians have repeatedly punched above their weight to show the world what Indianness is and the unique skill set and culture alongside. India organizes Pravasi Bhartiya Devas annually to celebrate and honor non-resident Indians' multi-layered contributions around the world ranging from their direct contribution to the Indian Treasury to their actions leading to the strengthening of Brand India. Sabhi Pravasi Bharatiyon ko videsi dharti par Bharat ka Rashtra Doot Brand Ambassador kehta hu. Your role as India's brand ambassador is diverse. You are brand ambassadors of Make in India. You are brand ambassadors of Yoga and Ayurveda. You are also brand ambassadors of India's cottage industries and handicrafts. At the same time, you are also brand ambassadors of India's millets. There are numerous ways how Indians have excelled and dominated sectors throughout the world with their skills and their everlasting will to create an impact. Google Sundar Pichai, Microsoft Satya Nadella, and former MasterCard CEO Ajay Banga are prime examples of Indian skill, will, and success throughout the world. The Indian identity and its unique characteristics are not only confined to STEM subjects. How can one ever forget the greatest Indian NRI to have ever lived, Mahatma Gandhi, who later returned to his motherland to lead the independence movement? According to a United Nations report, Indians comprised the world's largest diaspora in 2020, with approximately 18 million people living abroad. The contribution of NRIs has been an instrumental and integral part of the Indian growth story as well, with the World Bank predicting a 100 billion USD contribution through remittances alone. Indian diaspora through remittances, through investments, and in general by improving India's image, by getting technology and management know-how. Uh, so we must remember that it's not just brain drain, it's brain drain, it's brain circulation. I think the Indian diaspora has been absolutely critical. 
The Indian government began celebrating NRIs in 2003, and they have not stopped. There is a common saying among many throughout the world that more Indians means more positivity. Non-resident Indians have proven time and time again that this saying is not a mere conjecture. Indians and their contributions have made the world a better place. As New Delhi employs a host of measures to usher in an atmosphere of unity and brotherhood across the world through its agency in the form of G20 president or UNSC membership or other opportunities, Indians living outside of India are ensuring the world is convinced that Indians are truly an embodiment of skills, passion, humanity, and compassion. Moving on. As Nepal enters another political innings with Pushpa Kamal Dehel winning the confidence vote this week, the citizens are hoping to see a holistic change in the country's day-to-day -day government affairs that were severely hampered in the past couple of years. Political ramblings, power struggles and the inter-institutional confrontations have taken a major toll on Nepal's growth. Observers said they wanted to see a shift in political policies and they hoped for a smooth ride in times to come. Pushpa Kamal Dahel was announced as the Prime Minister of the country for the third time after he secured the House's confidence almost unanimously on January 10th. Dahel, who goes by the moniker Prachanda, managed to forge a seven-party coalition after his pre-poll alliance with the former Prime Minister Sher Bahadur Deuba fell apart in just days after the election results. His appointment comes amidst multifold political challenges being faced by the country, including stagnant economy and the non-alignment amongst the state institutions that literally went against each other in the country's recent history. Dahel acknowledged the challenges and said he was committed to work in the direction of bringing the country back on track. The major problem, however, that emerges during these times in Nepal is that the coalition has internal differences and this might further delay the development Nepal has been deprived of owing to recurrence of such situations. The Dahel-led government will also face several other challenges including that of runaway inflation, a decline in foreign exchange reserves and a low tax base that limits state spending on critical infrastructure. Political commentators have said that Kathmandu must prioritize the country's economic situation for it might spiral out of control in times to come. They also believe a stable system is absolutely necessary to bring everything on track. I think our immediate challenge is to bring the economy back on the track. Uh, there are um, currently the uh, economic situation of the country is not so good. It has to take multiple steps and immediate measures to improve the status of the economy. The second one is that uh, people are expecting service delivery from this government, control of the corruptions. Uh, overall, uh, this government needs to do a lot on the governance issues. Nepal has had 11 governments since 2008 when its 239-year-old monarchy was abolished and the instability has undermined business and investment. The recent political atmosphere, despite a democratic setup ruling the country, didn't fare well either as there were fallouts and confrontations which further pushed the country towards slowdown. If you see uh, the political situation of the past 3-4 years, we have seen that states' key institutions such as judiciary, parliament and other institutions are not working well uh, and the, the, the principle of the check of balance among the state institutions has been affected. So, Pushpa Kamal Dahal has to work a lot to let all institutions to work independently. Some observers have also opined that Nepal can attain prosperity and stability through its wise foreign policy as well. All it needs to do is take correct decisions. 
While Nepal's foreign policy has by and large remained dependent on capitalizing the trade and market rivalry between Nepal's giant neighbors India and China, the next tenure is going to be extremely crucial for it can dictate the future of the country. Moving on, Pakistan has tried to represent itself as a victim of terrorism. It claims to have made huge sacrifices to defeat the monster of violence and terrorism in the country. However, the truth is that the Ankoli nexus of the Pakistani civil government, military establishment and Islamic clerics have paved the way for the creation of a new, more radicalized society. How has Islamabad been able to play victim when some of the world's most wanted terrorists have been caught hiding in the country? Let's take a look at some of the politics at play. If you have snakes in your backyard, you can't expect them to bite only your neighbors. Eventually, they will bite the people who keep them in the backyard. Indian External Affairs Minister Jai Shankar recently criticized Pakistan for harboring terrorists and reminded the country that it will have to face the effects of homegrown extremism. Unfortunately, Pakistan, as expected, has not heeded Jai Shankar's advice and is suffering the consequences. Several jihadi outfits, who had always been priceless assets of the Pakistani government and military, have now emerged as a serious security threat for Islamabad. Pakistan's sort of strategy of a thousand cuts for India and other nations, and this whole fact that there's been a normalization of, of, of using groups such as Lashkari Taiba, Hezbollah Mujahideen, and the Harkatul Jihadi Islami, and all these kinds of groups that are linked to Al Qaeda, Pakistan has basically put the globe in a precarious situa situation. This potential threat was first identified eight years ago, when the intensity and cruelty of the attack on the Army Public School in Peshawar by the Tehriki Taliban shocked the entire world. Pakistan has since witnessed many more attacks on educational institutes, such as the 2016 assault on the Bacha Khan University and the burning down of schools in Gilgit Baltistan's Daimar district in 2018. Last year's Taliban victory in Kabul, which was facilitated by Islamabad, emboldened several Islamist groups in Pakistan, including the TTP. Following the surge in several terror attacks claimed by the TTP, the Pakistani government has also attempted to reach an agreement with the jihadist group. However, last month, the TTP ended the month-long ceasefire agreement with Pakistani authorities and began launching terrorist attacks again all over the country. Pakistan always believes that the, the neighborhood should be unstable. Given this belief, Pakistan has always thought that if the Taliban of Afghanistan comes to power in Kabul, it will benefit from the same. However, it does not, has not realized so far that if you breed instability in other countries, that instability can have a backlash in your own country. Several analysts inside and outside of Pakistan have criticized the Pakistani government for giving concessions to the Tehriki Taliban Pakistan. These analysts have opined that Pakistan's morally impractical practice of negotiating with the radical groups legitimizes terrorist aims. Successive governments in the Islamic Republic have always flirted with dangerous religious fanatics festering across Pakistan and aiding the growth of international terror organizations. These terror organizations have now mutated into two categories. One wing targets democracies like India, the United States, and the European Union, while the other practices a violent insurgency in Pakistan itself to establish a puritanical, violent order that intends to wipe out the last vestiges of civilized Pakistani society. Pakistan has lost thousands of lives in the country but still, the country has not changed its strategy. Failing to persecute several leaders of UN proscribed terror groups, and even going as far as to ensure their protection, 
Pakistan is directly assisting the burgeoning Islamic terrorist threat in the country. Pakistan has long failed to take appropriate action to combat terrorism within and outside of the country. The country is now facing the consequences of its inaction, and those suffering the most continue to be Pakistani citizens. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Amid an ongoing socio-economic crisis facing the country, young Yemenis are looking for ways to purchase cheaper furniture for their homes. This has caused the second-hand furniture business to flourish in the war-torn city of Sana'a. Imported from Saudi Arabia and refurbished locally, affordable second-hand furniture are displayed at bazaar markets in the city, which hosts hundreds of thousands of displaced by war. Yemen is grappling with a dire humanitarian crisis that has left millions hungry in the eight-year conflict that divided the country and wrecked the economy. Earlier this year, Yemen's warring sides agreed to a shaky truce, but they failed to renew it early in October. Since 2015, when the coalition intervened against the Houthis, Yemen's economy and basic services have collapsed, leaving 80% of the population of around 30 million needing help. With the increasing success of the second-hand furniture business, many bazaar shops have newly opened to meet high demand. Thousands of Israelis protested last week in Tel Aviv against the new government sworn in last month. Protesters took to the streets, waving flags, banging drums, blowing horns and chanting slogans against the new coalition and proposed judicial reforms to reduce powers of the Supreme Court. Protesters hoped that through these demonstrations they would be able to oust the new government. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the 73-year-old political veteran who is on trial for graft charges he denies, has sought to calm concerns about the fate of civil rights and diplomacy since his bloc of nationalist and religious parties secure a parliamentary majority in November 1 election. His allies include the religious Zionism and Jewish power parties which oppose Palestinian statehood and whose leaders, both West Bank settlers, have in the past agitated against Israel's justice system, its Arab minority and LGBT rights. His government secured 63 of a possible 120 parliamentary votes in a confirmatory ballot before the cabinet was sworn in. Japanese firm JCB has launched a new variety of credit card in Vietnam. It allows customers to customize their cards and choose from a variety of 12 designs like a Happy Cat, Sushi, Sumo, T-Set, Happy Crane and more. Vietnam's first JCB card was issued in 2011. This card was launched in cooperation with Military Commerce Joint Stock Bank. JCB has launched a credit card in Vietnam in 2011. It has been launched by the time and 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 the time. そしてあのこのベトナムにおけるですね、経済成長と、いわゆるキャッシュレス。このこの流れも非常にあの加速しておりまして、いわゆる消費者の皆様からも様々なニーズによってこのキャッシュレスというのが支えられております。ミリタリ
The leaders emphasized on how JCB respects and tries to serve the Vietnamese market. JCB is progressing to issue credit cards based on global policy to be familiar with issuing countries and catching up new trend of digitalization. This is the story of water management by Tokyo Metropolitan Government. The total length of the conduit is 27,000 kilometers. The Tokyo Metropolitan Government has improved the quality of the material used in making water pipes and changed the conduit pipes to ductile pipe, which has reduced the leakage to 3%. Authorities respond to the change in the quantity of water and make sure to keep the water supply stable for 24 hours. Continuous observation enables to solve any leakage or any other kind of problems because authorities are quick to respond. To prevent any kind of flooding of rivers, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government has made an underground pond in the mid of Tokyo which aims to gather flood water. In December 2022, work was done at 27 positions of 12 rivers. Tokyo Met staff observes rainfall and water levels of the river. They dispatch the information and image of observing camera on YouTube simultaneously. The department often has trainees from foreign countries as well who go to other countries later. This exchange aims to cooperate skillful maintenance of water and sewage services, prevention of water leaking and taking measures for flood management. Moving on. Indian tribes and the manifestation of their unique traditions through diverse cultural exhibitions has been a thing of joy for all to see. Whether it is the densely populated regions in the country's centre or it is the remote northeastern part, Indian tribals have not just preserved their centuries-old individual idiosyncrasies but have become a subject of sight and literature for the present city and village dwellers alike. We bring you one such tradition from the northeastern India's Imphal. Have a look. Donning red and white with spears in hands, a march past by these truly indigenous people is a vivid display of how the country's tribes have celebrated their heritage for centuries. A colourful showcase of vibrant cultural heritage, Lai Day, is celebrated with great enthusiasm in India's northeastern Manipur state. The captivating event draws people from across the country who come to witness the region's exclusive ethnic customs and unique celebrations. Held annually, the theme of this year's event was Our Culture, Our Identity. Historically, the event would be celebrated in small, individual confines, but the authorities have provided it a state push to preserve the region's unique culture. The festival's popularity has particularly scaled up in recent years. Every year we celebrate, we observe on this 12th January, but this year uh, we celebrate it for two days and then we honor our forefathers and then we observe this day in honor of our tradition and in history. The event saw the depiction of culture through performances and costumes. People came from far and wide to participate in the event. As per the beliefs of the locals, the dances performed in the festival are dedicated to Hindu god Shiva and goddess Parvati, who as per the same belief system created the universe. The unique form of dance performed with a spear indicates that the performer jumps in the air in the search of an enemy. This form of dance describes the warrior spirituality. We have so many cultural programs, as it means uh, where we teach the younger generations the stories of our past, how our forefathers came to this land, and there are many cultural items, events, and all the men folk, the women folk, the young and old, the colorful attires come and showcase, come and display the various items. The event is essentially a manifestation of days of hard work that is put into preparations. 
The ornaments and props used in performances are mostly handmade. People of Manipur believe that the celebrations keep their traditions alive and reinforces belief in traditional elements. This two-day festival highlights the legacy of the Pomai community, one of the major Naga tribes. India is home to nearly 650 distinct tribes, of which 33 live in the northeastern state of Manipur alone. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.